Hey everybody, welcome to Summit. Thank you for letting us in to your life. My name is Gary and this is Tracy. She is my friend, but she is also the executive director of the Orlando campus mm -hmm. and we haven't had a chance to host together. No, so this is an honor to be beside you well, as we host this time. Really glad you are with us as we continue in our series, God at the Heart. We're looking at the Trinity, the nature of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and what we can learn about the goodness of God through looking at uh, God in three persons. But before we hear from Kaylee Newkirk, our teaching minister, uh, there's some exciting things happening in the life of the church that we wanna talk to you guys about. Yeah, so if you are married or soon to be married, we have a really fun marriage date night coming up. Because um, here's the deal, we realize that marriage is great, but it's also really, really hard. Um, and so we are crafting this night, creating this night um, where married couples can come together and we can laugh together. We can have some content together. There's gonna be a taco bar, which is really awesome. That's huge. Um, taco bar, lots of really good desserts. You had me at um, taco bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna be so much fun and you'll get to meet some other people you go to church with and um, hopefully feel really encouraged and edified in your marriage, leave with some really great tools uh, to go home and continue um, with your spouse. But all the information for that is linked below, but it'll be on February 6th and we're really looking forward to seeing you at that. Awesome, mark your calendar for that. Yep. And now let's get into worship. We're gonna worship through hearing and seeking to apply God's word together, also through singing songs to God together and uh, one other way as well. Yeah, through the tithe and offering. So if you're new, I want you to hear that we are really grateful um, that you're worshiping with us here. And um, we don't want you to feel any obligation to give. We want this service to be a gift to you. And if you would like uh, to make yourself known to us, we would love that. You can click on the I'm new link below um, and that'll go straight to us and we'll reach out to you and that'd be great. Um, but if you are a regular attender of Summit and you're a member of the body of Christ, you know that we give because we actually get to participate um, with God and the work that he's doing in the world um, with our finances. And it's really a fantastic way to be able to serve our community and um, yeah, be obedient to God. And so if you would like to participate in the tithe and offering during this service, you can do so um, by following the prompts on the screen. You can also click the link below to give directly through the website. Yeah, so let's worship together the God who is three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit.
Last week, we traced the Holy Spirit's movement from the Old Testament. If you recall, there are about 400 times that we see the Spirit, the Ruach, doing something in the Old Testament. He's all over the place, filling people, being poured out on people, cleansing people, resting on people, rushing on people. And, and this week, we're going to continue our pursuit of that Holy Spirit, but we're going to move from the Old Testament. We'll get a little Old Testament from the Old Testament into the New Testament where he gets a, a new name, by the way, a Greek name. So it's no longer Ruach, but Pneuma. Same spirit, different word. And his current runs like a fiber optic thread in so many different ways through the tapestry of scripture. So many different threads going all of these directions, some of them intertwined, connected, all of it. And to get an idea of the, the personality of the spirit, um, we're gonna follow one of those threads, just one. I mean, there's so many, too many. Uh, we can't do them all, but we're gonna follow just one thread. We're just gonna tug on it to see where it leads us from the Old Testament into the New. So you don't have to follow along in your Bible. We have all the references for this printed out or you can click on it in the, in the digital bulletin, but uh, you can just listen as I go through this thread and just kind of try to be present with me. So in Genesis 1, we see the spirit hovering, right? Better translation might be quivering over the tohu vavohu, the, the wild and waste of uncreation, just, just, just waiting for that word from God, let there be, so that the spirit, the, the ruach can spring into action, enlivening, animating the creation, bringing life to what the father has made through the son. So he's there at the beginning, which means again, the, the, the spirit is an eternal member of the Trinity, He's an eternal member of the triune God, a person of the Trinity. So then we can see the spirit kind of weaving to and, throw, to and fro, giving strength and wisdom to the leaders, the judges, the kings. And then, of course, inspiring the prophets like Joel and Ezekiel and Isaiah. So prolific, right? Isaiah foretells the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And then the spirit leads the Israelites out of slavery, through the desert, and even comes and stands between them and the Egyptian army standing like a protective angel. In the New Testament, the Spirit pre prepares the way for Jesus. So we've moved into the New Testament now and the Spirit is preparing the way for Jesus through John the Baptist. We, we read in Luke that John was filled with the Spirit even from birth. You know, So again, we get this idea the Spirit only shows up in the New Testament. It's not true, he's been there the whole time. He's preparing the way. We see the Spirit overshadow Mary, the unwed virgin, and then and, and placing in her womb the incarnate Christ. We see the Spirit resting on this, this old faithful priest named Simeon. And I love Simeon because he's, he's thrice inspired. He, he gets he, three times the Spirit touches him. So first, you know, uh, the Spirit rests on him. It says in Luke, the Spirit rested on Simeon. And then the Spirit also revealed to Simeon that he wouldn't die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. And then when Mary and Joseph take baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated, it says the Spirit moved him. The Spirit moved him, prompted him to go to the temple. And there he sees, he sees Jesus. And he takes that baby in his arms. And he says this prophetic blessing over him, which is just dripping with images from Isaiah. Isaiah's prophecy about Jesus, which again was inspired by the Spirit. You can see these threads kind of weaving their way together. And then we see the Spirit break through the heavens when Jesus goes to be baptized and it comes down and it rests on him at his baptism. And then immediately that same Spirit drives him into the desert to be tempted, to be tested by Satan. And, and Jesus himself tells his disciples, when you're tested, when you're persecuted for my sake, when you're taken before the courts, don't worry about preparing your defense because in that hour, in your hour, the Spirit will come to you and give you the words to say. The Spirit will comfort martyrs in their hour of death and give them the words to say. Jesus is crucified and buried and Paul tells us in Romans 8 that it's the Spirit of God that actually brings life back into Jesus' body. Jesus is raised from the dead through the Spirit of God. And then we see that huge moment in Acts 2 where the Spirit came to rest on the believers like tongues of fire over top of them. That's where, I think that's where most Christians, like we kind of think, oh, that's when the spirit shows up. No, no, he's been, he's been here the whole time. Look at these threads, right? And so he, he comes to rest on, on people and they start speaking languages that they had never studied. And what are they saying? They're, they're saying the mighty works of God in the Old Testament passages that they have studied about what God has done. But they're saying it in these different languages because there's all these people gathered for Pentecost, for this festival from all over the world. 
And so they're proclaiming God's works in each of these person's native tongues. It's this beautiful moment of inspiration. And then that same spirit spreads like wildfire, you know, over Jews and Gentiles when, when the, the disciples begin to preach the gospel. And then Paul, Paul, that ludicrous wild man, Paul, the, 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 the late great addition to the apostles team, Paul tells us that when the spirit comes to dwell in our hearts, there will be evidence, right? We call that fruit. There will be fruit. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. So again, this is only one thread. This is one thread that we've just barely tugged on, but the spirit is all over the place, all over the place. Uh, he has spirit fingers in every cookie jar of the biblical narrative, you might say. And Jesus himself, he has something to say about the spirit. So when Jesus is about to, to, to go through his passion and to die and to leave um, and to ascend to the father, he, he tells the disciples about this spirit that's going to be coming to them. And so I, I want that to be our primary text for today. We're going to look at what Jesus himself says about this coming spirit. I think this will help us to get to know not just, again, not just information about the spirit, but, but the person, the personality, you might say, of this Holy Spirit. So to that end, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for sending us the paraclete, the helper, the Holy Spirit to be with us throughout our many trials, throughout our many needs. Thank you for making your home in our hearts so that we always have the opportunity to access you. You're always there. We just have to ask. We just have to connect with you. Lord, I don't live my life that way most of the time. I don't live with it at the forefront of my mind that you're always with me, that you're always available to me. And of course, the, the, the ideas that our culture gives us about um, an angry God, a wrathful God, don't help the matter. And so, Lord, I'm so grateful as we've gone through this Trinity series to learn about your, your life-giving, outgoing love and the fact that you created us just to lavish your love on us and that you want to come and make your home in our hearts. And so, Lord, we want to learn about the third person of the Spirit who makes his home in us. Would you help us? Would you help us to lay down at your feet everything, all the assumptions, anything that would keep us from understanding who you are and by extension, who you call us to be. And so we pray these things in the name of your son and your Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, John chapter 14, this is John 14, beginning in verse 15. Let's look at this, this together. By the way, I'm gonna be reading from the message translation, not because it's my favorite, but because it, this passage in particular is just so much easier to follow and understand in that translation. So uh, ho hopefully that helps. John 14, beginning in verse 15. This is Jesus talking to his disciples again about them receiving the spirit. Verse 15, if you love me, show it by doing what I've told you to do. I'll talk to the Father and he'll provide you another friend so that you'll always have someone with you. This friend is the spirit of truth. The godless world can't take him in because it doesn't have eyes to see him, doesn't know what to look for. But you know him already because he has been staying with you and will even be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming back. In just a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you're going to see me because I am alive and you're about to come alive. At that moment, you will know absolutely that I'm in my Father and you are in me and I'm in you. The person who knows my commandments and keeps them, that's who loves me. And the person who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and make myself plain to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said, Master, why is it that you're about to make yourself plain to us but not to the world? Because a loveless world, said Jesus, is a sightless one. If anyone loves me, he will carefully keep my word and my father will love him. We'll move right into the neighborhood. Not loving me means not keeping my words. The message you are hearing isn't mine. It's, it's the message of the father who sent me. I'm telling you these things while I'm still living with you. The friend, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send at my request will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all the things I've told you. I'm leaving you well and whole. That's my parting gift to you, peace. I don't leave you the way you're used to being left, feeling abandoned, so don't be upset. Don't be distraught. So a few things that I think we can learn about the spirit here, which are supported, of course, by, by everything that we've already seen about the spirit, this thread that we've followed. You know, remember from last week, test the spirits. Make sure that this teaching 
aligns with the whole counsel of God. So, so, so what can we learn about the Spirit? Three things uh, that I want to pull out for us. Um, first, that the Spirit comes by invitation. Second, that the Spirit purifies what it touches. And third, that the Spirit brings new life. So first, the, the Spirit comes by invitation. I want to direct you back to verse 23 here. If anyone loves me, he will carefully keep my word and my Father will love him. We'll move right into the neighborhood. So, so the Spirit comes by invitation, but invitation is more than just a verbal prayer. I think we have this idea that, you know, that get the, receiving the Holy Spirit is just about some magic words, the magic prayer. Jesus, let your spirit come live in my heart. And don't get me wrong, I am not underselling prayer. It is powerful. And the prayer, Jesus, let your spirit come live in my heart, is a powerful prayer. But it is only one type of invitation. It's a verbal invitation, right? When, when I was in my 20s um, and I was learning accounting and doing some accounting, I started to, to do some HR as well. And as a kindness to me, my boss set me up with a, with a meeting, a networking meeting with one of his contacts who was ki kind of a big deal in HR. I mean, she was like at the, the highest level of leadership in HR in her very big company. Uh, so I could pick her brain and maybe have a mentor. But I think she must have said yes to that meeting as like a personal favor to him. <laughs> Because when, like, maybe she owed him money, I don't know, gambling debt, who knows. Uh, but Because when, when I showed up to the meeting and she took one look at me and my Rieger putty and my purple hair, it was so obvious from that moment forward. She just, she was, can we please just get this over with as quickly as humanly possible? I mean, posture, body language, tone of voice, shortness of responses, all of it basically screamed, like, let's just get this over with because you little girl doing HR are an absurdity. You're like an anime character with a spreadsheet. So I, so I, learned, I learned something from that meeting, something that did in fact benefit my career moving forward. I learned that there was more than one way to send an invitation, right? She gave a verbal invitation, but her body, everything about it emphatically told me that I was not welcome to come in. Verse 23, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my word. That's how I know I'm invited. That's how I know I'm invited in. And we'll move right into the neighborhood. Father, Son, Spirit, we will come at your invitation, which you will issue not in word alone, but with your body, with your whole self. By making the vessel of your heart an inviting place for the Spirit to live. Right? Invitation is more than just saying, come over. It's making the space ready to receive your guest. It's about making the space ready. Maybe you've invited the spirit to live in your heart, but is your heart, is your heart very inviting? Have you vacuumed the place up? You know, have you, have you got rid of the dog hair? Have you put the kettle on, made some biscuits? Have you prepared some icebreaker questions to ask them so that you can get to know this very wonderful, incredible, mysterious person, this Holy Spirit? In our thread that we followed in the beginning, we see the Spirit showing up with people, in people who have, who have invited the Spirit with more than just their words. And certainly they do pray, right? Jesus prays, Simeon prays, the apostles pray at Pentecost, but they were not just saying words, they were devoted. They were studying God's word. They were, they were fasting together. Verse 23, they were keeping the commands of Jesus as what? As a means to inviting him to move in. They were preparing the house by making their hearts an inviting space for the spirit of God to dwell. Jesus himself, you remember, uh, he, he, he follows the law of the Torah to a T. He goes to John the Baptist and asks to be baptized. Jesus doesn't need a baptism of repentance that John was offering. He, he never, done, never done anything to repent of. Although my husband's parents will say that the water into wine thing was a sin, which is why they maintain that it's grape juice that he created and not wine. And we still love each other anyway because that's the unifying power of the Holy Spirit. So, but Jesus, Jesus doesn't need to repent of anything. He doesn't need a baptism of repentance. And John even initially refuses. He's like, no, I'm not gonna baptize. You should baptize me. And Jesus says, no, I, ha I have to do this in order to fulfill all righteousness. Even Jesus prepared the house and his was already perfect. Mint condition. Invitation is not just saying, come in. It's preparing the house, making the space habitable 
for a holy spirit to live. Now there's a a whole other layer that we can't get into about how, uh, you know, if we are preparing our hearts for the Holy Spirit to enter, we couldn't possibly be doing that unless the Spirit was knocking on the door of our heart already. Uh, But that's a sermon for another day. If you have questions about that, you can email Doug Foley, Pastor Doug, or you can email Professor Jim Miller at asbury.edu for prevenient grace questions. Okay, so (laughs) we, the Spirit comes at our invitation and that's more than just a verbal invite. Second, the spirit purifies what it touches. There's so many places that the spirit is, is, is associated with this idea of purifying fire, right? John the Baptist says, I baptize with water, but the one coming after me is gonna baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, show it by doing what I've, show it by doing what I've told you. I will talk to the father and he'll provide you another friend so that you'll always have someone with you. Why do I need someone with me all the time? Because human beings have proven through the whole of created history (laughs) that we are incapable of keeping God's commands perfectly or at all, really. We're just really bad at it. We need help. We need a helper. We need the helper. There is a purifying element of the Holy Spirit, a fire which burns away the bits of us that are unfit to stand in the presence of a holy God. That's why, that's why sin becomes so uncomfortable when you become a Christian. I became a Christian just before college, so I already had a group of friends, right? I was running with a posse and we were, to put it mildly, up to no good. (laughs) Now, in fairness, that was mostly kind of self-medicating escapism due to our dysfunctional families of origin, but if you wanna hear more about that, you gotta come to regroup. So, So my friends, we had, they had no loyalty to the Bible or to the commandments, right? Sex before marriage is a sin, why is that a sin? That's, that's an expression of love. Doesn't God love love? Isn't that what you've been saying? That's, I mean, I thought that too. I had that, I had that kind of mindset too, but then I became a Christian and the Holy Spirit began to purify my heart to burn away those impurities. And suddenly sin got very uncomfortable. Why? Because it just got red hot. It's being burned. It's being burned in me. In our thread in the beginning, we mentioned the Apostle Paul and and he says in Galatians that that there will be evidence of this purifying presence of the Spirit in our hearts. The fruit, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. But listen, because this is important, the fruit, that fruit is evidence of the purifying presence of the spirit, not a means to it. Does that make sense? Like uh, more simply, it means that, that, that the doing good stuff doesn't purify me, but the purifying presence of the Holy Spirit makes me want to do more good stuff. When the spirit is in me and it's burning off those impurities in my heart, the envy, the lust, the pride, what's left? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so on. Patience isn't something that we can muster up in the moment as anyone who's been driving in Orlando for any length of time can tell you. You can't just make it come out of nowhere. It's, it's, it's the outcome, the inevitable outcome, actually, the byproduct, the evidence of, of, of that purifying spirit already at work in me. And that is both uh, good news and bad news. The bad news is you, you can't force it, can't force fruit out of nowhere. You know, you, you think you're being patient, I think I'm being patient by just not, just being silent, by not saying all the mean things to your spouse that you wanna say about how he loads the dishwasher or whatnot. That's not patience. And, and, and in fact, your whole family is walking around on eggshells because they are just biding their time until the explosion they know is coming because essentially you've stuffed a sock in the top of a volcano. That's not patience. We can't make fruit appear by force. It has to grow over time under the right conditions, fruit will grow. So your job isn't squeezing out a fruit. You know, it's not, it's not acting holy or mustering up patience. Your, your job, your only job is to provide the right conditions and then give it time. Provide the right conditions. That's, that's what you gotta do. Make that heart an inviting space for the spirit to move into. Don't try to manufacture fruit. You'll you'll fail at that. So that's the bad news. The good news is that under the right conditions, 
over time, you can't stop fruit from growing. You don't have to try that hard. You know, as long as it's attached to the vine, getting water, that puppy's gonna grow, grow, grow. John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You can't stop it. If you provide the right conditions and give it time, you can't stop it from growing. You don't have to try so hard. So, so just as an aside, by way of practical wisdom, especially young people, the, the digital landscape that we are living in today, your clicks, your likes, your subscriptions, your eyeballs have become a monetized commodity. Every gifted person on the internet wants you to follow them. And some of them will be Christians. But, but gifts, gifts, and, and, and if they're truly indicative of the purifying presence of the Holy Spirit, listen, gifts will always come in tandem with fruit. They won't appear without one another. Even an incredible gift like speaking in tongues or, or some crazy stuff like handling poisonous snakes like that you talk about in Mark or, 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 or more likely persuasive charismatic teaching. Even incredible gifts in the absence of fruit is not indicative of the presence of a purifying spirit. I mean, if you meet someone who's super gifted and they're a real jerk, get out of there. Don't follow them. They're gonna steer you wrong, I promise. And, and, and you, you have your whole life in front of you, right? To grow, to learn, to, 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 to gain your own followers, to, to, to develop your own gifts. And so my desperate plea to you, coming from someone who has learned all of, almost all of my lessons the hard way, please, don't let your gifts outpace your fruit. Or to borrow a phrase that we used last week, don't let yourself be gifted beyond your level of obedience because it doesn't work in the long run. You know, gifts without fruit is just Christian theater. And one day the critics are gonna tear you apart. A friend of mine asked me, you know, how do we prevent that from happening? Do we have control over that? Like, how do we prevent our, uh, our fruit, our, our, our gifts from outpacing our fruit? Or, or the way that she put it, how do we prevent um, our ambition from outpacing our maturity? And what I told her, it's, I mean, it's, just, it's a pretty simple truth. It's all about relationship. Again, remember, the, the, the Holy Spirit is not a force. The Holy Spirit is a person and we get to have relationship with that spirit. But, but the way that we form relationship with that spirit is so unspectacular that I think we mistake it for being unimportant because the way that we do it is what? Time and space. Time and space. That's all. Time and space. How do you give time and space to the spirit? Read God's word. The spirit is all over those pages, just interwoven in that tapestry. Talk to God. That's all prayer is, right? Ask him some questions. Remember, remember when his kid's birthday is, which is easy because it's Christmas, you know, or, or, or ask, him, ask him how he feels about you. Stalk his interests by reading the Bible the same way that you would stalk the interests of your crush by reading their Facebook this is how we develop relationship. I had this funny conversation recently where I realized that I don't remember meeting my, my best friend, Allison, and I love me some Allison. She is a safe place for me to be at my worst. She's a prayer warrior for me. She spoon fed me chicken and dumplings when I was very ill. I mean, I just, she speaks to me in my native love language of memes. I love me some Allison. And, uh, and, and she's been my best friend for at least the last five years. But I realized I have probably known Allison for over a decade from back when her husband used to work here at Summit. But in early 2018, I went on this trip with her to, to Africa, to Malawi um, with our partner organization, World Relief. And uh, that trip was so fun and so surprising and, and so interesting. And, and, and Allison was my roommate and we were the only two women on the trip. And so we spent all of our time together, you know, hours and hours of, of not sleeping <laughs> due to jet lag or mosquitoes uh, or, you know, lack of AC. I don't know, we're so American. And, <laughs> and, and so we just chat away in our beds and I would hear her hopes about, uh, her hopes and her fears about her two daughters who were grown up way too fast. You know, how she met Jeff, I didn't know that. 
sharing bags of M&Ms together back when people used to share food and that was okay. <laughs> watching, uh, watching her nearly run through a wall when a cockroach scurried into our room underneath the door and laughing, so much laughing at the cockroach incident, at the, the shower situation, um, laughing because she still offered me essential oils as bug repellent even though she knew my position on essential oils. <laughs> I mean, I might have known her for a decade before that, but I didn't know her. I didn't know her until I gave that relationship time and space away from all of the other responsibilities, the other noise. We had time and space. That's what made the relationship special to me. And we didn't even have that as an agenda item. We didn't do it on purpose. That's just what happens under the right conditions with time and space, things grow. So it's not magical, you know? If you wanna develop this relationship with the Holy Spirit, you don't need some like crazy emotional conversion story. You don't need any special gifts. You, if, you're in, if you're listening to this, you probably already know the Holy Spirit, but maybe the relationship just isn't, it's not as intimate as you want it to be. That's okay. All you need is time and space. Provide the right conditions and that relationship will grow and it will become more and more important to you without you even trying. Okay, so the spirit comes by invitation and that's more than a verbal prayer. The spirit purifies what it touches and, and there will be evidence of that purification. And our last point today, the spirit brings new life, new life, wherever it goes. Verse 18, I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming back. In just a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you're going to see me because I am alive and you're about to come alive. The Spirit brings new life. What have we learned throughout this whole Trinity series? We learned that the Spirit of God, the Ruach, was busy enlivening the creation at the very beginning. We learned that the Spirit of God, it, it brought Jesus' life, it brought life back into Jesus on Easter morning. And that spirit brings new life, new meaning to things, new meaning to the words of Old Testament passages that, that the disciples have read. In the Gospel of John, you get, you get this idea that the disciples are maybe not the sharpest tools in the shed, like in John at least. They're kind of bumbling. They don't really understand anything Jesus is telling them or how it ties back into Old Testament prophecy until, until he dies, until he dies. And then the spirit comes and it brings new life to these old passages that they've studied and memorized, and suddenly it makes sense. They understand what Jesus was telling them about what he's trying to do. And once they understand what Jesus is doing, they find hope. Verse 25, I'm telling you these things while I'm still living with you. The friend, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send at my request will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all the things I've told you. I'm leaving you well and whole, that's my parting gift to you, peace, peace. So many of the verbs attached to the Holy Spirit are teaching verbs, teach, remain, remind, convince, guide into truth, speak what is heard, declare his words. Dr. Levison says it this way, the all that the Holy Spirit will teach the disciples is the all of what Jesus himself has said and done. Teaching, in short, is a matter of inspired reminding. I love that. Inspired reminding. It kind of ties back into what we talked about last week. The Spirit inspires through preparation. Like, we have to study His Word. We have to read the Bible. Otherwise, there will be nothing for Him to remind us of. It's only through inspired hindsight that a crucifixion can look like glory. It's only through inspired hindsight that a crucifixion can leave us the parting gift of peace. I wanna wrap up today with a story from Dr. Levson's book, Boundless God, the Spirit in the Old Testament. A friend of mine who once worked for an international aid agency told me how workers deal with starving children. At the acute stages of starvation, the body shuts down. It is numb, no longer ravenous, barely hungry. Aid workers respond by placing sugar water on the lips of the starving kids. Eventually, the fortunate ones begin again to feel hunger. When they do, they hurt intensely. Their bodies racked with pain. They scream, bellow, and wail as their small bodies begin again to beg for water and bread. They are resurrected. 
but the midwife of this new life is overwhelming pain. Before Jesus so graciously made his home in me, I had been giving pieces of my heart away to so many different things, you know, um, the pursuits of recognition in education or work, making money, romantic relationships, trying to do the types of hobbies that I thought would transform me into a fun, interesting, lovable person. You know, I, I gave pieces of my heart away to these things, just hoping that one, any of them would give me life back. And they never did, not for long. I thought I was investing, right? That I could expect a return, but I found over time that I wasn't investing. All that I was doing was being drained and none of it was coming back. New life can be extremely painful. It was for me, especially at first, because suddenly I recognized how desperately, completely empty I really was how completely void of nourishment I had been for so long, how selfish I was, how desperate I was, how impatient, how bitter, how demanding, how entitled, how insecure, and yet somehow also how prideful. It is painful to experience our own emptiness in the presence of God, but, but that's when the possibility of new life exists. It's when our soul begins to register how very empty it is, how very hungry we are, that we are then able to receive nourishment, that there's a possibility of being filled. So we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of that. We don't have to be afraid to feel our hunger pangs when there's already bread on the table. The Spirit comes at our invitation when we make the space ready to receive him. The Spirit purifies, and we will see evidence of this. We'll see the fruit. And the Spirit brings new life to old things, to dead things. He's always opening our eyes to the truth, even when what's true makes us ache. But the one truth, the ultimate truth that the Spirit wants to teach you and me, the whole thing, is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that he came and he died in payment for our sins so that we could make our way back to the Father. And, and, and that kind of truth, that there is a Father who is overwhelmingly bursting with love for me, that there is a Son, Jesus Christ, who died and paid the debt that I deserve to pay, and that there is this Spirit who brings dead things back to life like my heart. For me, at least, that's worth the ache. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so grateful for all the pain that you have endured so that we wouldn't have to endure it for all eternity. Thank you that you got up on that cross and allowed yourself to be separated from the love of the Father that you had enjoyed eternally so that we wouldn't be separated forever. Lord, we need you. We need to understand the kind of God you are and not the kind of God we think. We need to understand your purpose for us, your love for us, because it changes how, how we do our lives. It changes where we put our energy. Lord, I pray that every person who is hearing these words would, would, would reach out to you with open arms, and say, please come. Please, Lord, help me make my heart ready for you to dwell in me. Help me understand who you are, your personality. All three persons of this Trinity, this triune God, are loving and truthful and just and kind and merciful and peaceful. Lord, help us to better understand that reality so that it changes how we live out our reality. And we pray this in the holy and precious name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
principle within of watchful godly fear the sensibility of sin the pain to feel it near I want the first approach to feel of pride or wrong desire to catch the wandering of my will and quench the kindling fire Thank you for being with us and being the church where you are. As we move into this week ahead, here's a good reminder. God is a God who brings new things, and he does it through his spirit. But we need to return to him again and again and again. And so my encouragement is focus on, look on, look toward this God who makes all things new. And one aspect of remembering that the church has shared in for as long as the church has existed is communion. There's a link below that will walk you through how to take communion. I can't encourage you enough to do that as an act of worship, remembering the God who makes things new. Everyone hear these words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in God's grace and his peace. The service has ended.